Hi, everybody, and welcome to our Introduction to Measurement and Verification webinar. This is the first webinar in a series of four on the concept of m and I'd like to introduce Eric Matzi. Um, he's going to be walking us through the introduction today. Hi, everybody. Yes, um, so I'm Eric, and uh, my background, as you can see, I'm a certified in two different um, m and programs, the CMBP, the PMBA. I have a background in mechanical engineering and policy. And yes, let's uh, move ahead and go through an introduction to measurement and verification. Next slide. Okay, so these are the objectives we're going to cover. It, we have um, made the objectives uh, manageable for the hour that we have. So we're just going to cover what m and is, what it isn't, the four basic options. We'll understand what adjustments are and how why they are critical. We won't have time to get into how to do adjustments. And really, we want to under, help um, all of you understand and reinforce what you already know that um, you know how to develop an M and V strategy which utilizes uh, the best practices. Um, I'd like to share the results of a survey, the menti.com survey. So I will, um, I guess, share my screen. Excuse me here. And um, sorry, there we go. So now I have permission and I'll share my screen and share the results of our Menti meter survey. So we've um, we've got the responses here. Uh, Megan, you can see it on your screen. Just confirm. Yes. All good. Yeah. So for the audience here, we have about 30 responses, which is good. And you can see the options. Uh, so many of you are in a position of hiring. Many of you are either leading or part of a team doing m and m and is very critical for organizations that provide financing, like electric utilities or loans, um, uh, energy services companies. So th there's a couple people wearing that hat. And then there's just general interest, but no specific role yet. So, you know, we do have a wide range of audience here, and that, that's what we're assuming for this uh, webinar. And so that's good. Uh, so I will stop sharing my screen again, and let's see if Megan can pull up the slides and go on to the next one, please. So you'll be able to access this presentation after, and there's a list of abbreviations that uh, are used common in M&B and used in this presentation. So you'll have that uh, to refer to. They're generally defined as they're used, but but they're there as well in one place. Next, please. Okay, so the outline, what we're going to do is cover what is m and and why invest in it. And the second phase is we'll overview the methods and best practices. And then we have some uh, interactive uh, questions uh, prepared for you using this menti.com tool, the one we just used for the survey. And then we'll, uh, we're aiming to leave you know, five to ten minutes to cover general question and answer, anything you want to ask about m and uh, next, please. So what is M&V and why invest? Please, next slide. So this is a definition of M&V from the International Protocol or IPMVP. So again, I am a member of the IPMVP committee. Uh, I actually contributed to this protocol and it is the most widely used protocol. And the definition that the IPMVP provides is shown here. And it is consistent with essentially any protocol you find will have a very similar definition. Um, so it has to do with taking measurements, doing analyses, um, of course, planning to do all of that work to um, quantify uh, energy savings from energy efficiency projects. So that's our basic definition. Next, please. So it's important to know from the outset that what what is M and V is you have to measure something or it's not M and V. So it sign, sounds maybe blindingly obvious that that's the case. However, there are cases where, let's say, energy efficiency measures are installed and 
various party funding agencies want to use what a common phrase is called deemed savings, where you use evidence and measurements from other projects and you basically assume that those apply to the projects of interest. And that's a perfectly acceptable thing to do. It's just not M and V. If you want to call it M and V legitimately, according to IPMVP and essentially all protocols, you need to measure something on the actual system that is of interest and was installed. Measurements done in the lab or by the manufacturer or extrapolated from somewhere else. If those are the only measurements that are being done, it, it does not qualify as being M and V. Uh, next, please. So what is M and V used for? Throughout this webinar and, and really in general, M and V is talked about in, in the context of saving energy from energy efficiency. Uh, however, the concepts and methods we're going to introduce, although we will do that today, we will by default talk about energy savings from energy efficiency projects. Um, m and methods and, this, and what we're going to cover today apply equally to other types of measures or other strategies, if you will, such as fuel switching, electrification, as an example, demand response. There are m and best practices for how to quantify using measurements, you know, peak demand reductions, for example, distributed generations, for example, solar PV panels, there are M&B methods for that, or energy storage, such as thermal storage or electric batteries. So again, these methods apply to all those, and but we're going to talk about efficiency and energy savings by default. So when is M&B used and really by whom? Um, so Wherever there's money exchanged, it's more likely there's m and is required. That's actually the genesis of m and how the protocols came about. So energy performance pro uh, contracts, as you see, uh, government agencies giving loans like the, the green infrastructure loans in Canada, um, demand side management subsidies or programs where let's say utilities are providing ratepayer money to specific customers, then m and So certifications, trading, um, those are the types of um, policies and programs where M&V is used. Next, please. So M&V can serve many purposes. Um, uh, to start with, M&V actually conducting and completing M&V can actually increase energy savings. So it's not only about observing what savings are achieved and i'll show some data in the next couple slides that um, doing m and v actually can improve energy savings um, it's already mentioned it can be used to document and and let's say validate financial transactions like loans or subsidies um, it, it can actually be used and rolled into um, it can improve operation and maintenance um, and what you know one example is to roll it into uh, facility management systems, uh, energy management information systems. So the meters, um, the tools and resources from M and V do not have to, they can be used beyond the scope of what you consider M and V. They can roll into ongoing energy management and maintenance management for a facility. Next slide, please. Uh, m and can also help uh, manage energy budgets, validate, for example, greenhouse gas emission reductions. Um, you might sometimes hear the abbreviation uh, em and Evaluation, Measurement and Verification, because evaluation of programs often, essentially almost always uses uh, m and as part of that policy and program evaluation. And it can also just support public and and, and um, you know, company understanding of energy management and, and bolster the credibility, if you will. Next slide, please. Let me get a drink. Okay, these are some data that show just a sample of data for projects I've worked on where m and can actually improve the performance of the project. So it's not only about observing what happened or what is happening. So these are a sample of four projects where m and was done partway through the reporting period. And we're gonna learn what the reporting period is in m and terms, that's the, the timeline where energy savings are going to be quantified post install. And 
with these projects, m and was done, let's say, partway through the reporting period early on, say in the first couple of months after uh, uh, a project was installed where it was planned to do, let's say, 12 months of reporting period. And in these four samples, you can see the blue bars, the interim savings were lower. And then with that feedback, the operation maintenance staff for these various projects, they were able to go back and um, look into what, you know, what do some forensic investigation is a common phrase and do some improvements. So for example, that first one there, the uh, demand ventilation, uh, what was found is there was a whole bank of VFD drives, variable frequency drives that had not been programmed. So they had been installed, operating at 100% speed, not modulating, and then that was found through m &B, and then all it took was some programming and the savings went up. Next slide, please. This is another example of looking at a project over multiple years where m and is done every year for a single project. And what this illustrates, this is another one I've done where, um, you know, doing m often m and is done for one year, if at all, or, or one time period, you know, shortly after uh, immediately following installation and commissioning. And if you kind of maybe put your hand over these bars here, you can imagine a scenario where m and is done for that first year, and you can sort of blank out the rest of it and say, oh, well, what would the stakeholders assume there? Well, we saw 400,000 kilowatt hours per year, 400 megawatt hours per year savings the first year. We're probably getting those every year, right? It would be natural to think that. Well, this m and showed that, well, it didn't. It, it was declining. It went to zero in year three. I mean, there's a whole story behind this that of um, project specifics, but it's, it's representative of what can happen um, and, and it shows that doing the process of m and provides that feedback and the opportunity to actually improve the performance of systems. And if you're not measuring it, you, you would never know, for example, that savings went to zero in year three. Next slide, please. These are the type of activities involved in m and and it really starts early with m and planning. And as you know, the best practice, one of the best initial um, task of m and is to develop an m and plan early on and the, the protocols provide guidance how to do that then it gets into collecting data baseline data before uh, an energy efficiency measure is is installed let's say and that could involve baseline modeling of the system once the um, measure is installed then it gets to verifying like with a, a site visit validating that you know, confirming nameplates, confirming it's operating, collecting spot readings, and so on. And that it's not only installed, but actually tuned and commissioned to operate in the, the, the intended manner. And then the post, uh, the reporting period can start where you measure and collect data. That may in involve the analysis doing baseline adjustments, which we'll talk about, and ultimately to reporting and also communicating the findings um, could be added to this timeline. Next, please. So how do we calculate energy savings? Um, that word calculate could be, and, and actually in the IP MVP could be replaced with the word determined. M energy savings are determined doing calculations that compares the baseline system to the efficient system. Um, one of the basic concepts of M&V is that it's not just a straightforward before versus after. It, it could be, but most often it's not. Very rarely really is it. And that's because uh, conditions change. So next slide, please. Um, yeah, there's an animation there just says, you know, we want to be able to attribute savings to the measure and not to other factors that are changing. So next slide, please. So what are those factors? And I think, Megan, you can hit, go ahead and hit uh, return. Yeah, I had an animation there. So how do we actually determine energy savings is you take into account other factors that can affect and, and are significant drivers of energy consumption, whatever those factors might be. And here are common examples, outdoor air temperature on an HVAC system, heating and cooling, that's always gonna be a factor. 
uh, occupancy or in an industrial plant, the production rate or the product quality mix that's produced, human behavior, control settings, or just uh, what falls under what we'll learn are called non-routine adjustments, just equipment changes, change outs, just big changes that um, happened that were not really expected, but of course, when they are observed to happen, and we have in our, our question period, I have a little case study of that where um, we have a project that uh, there was a big change from uh, the baseline to the post. And so in determining energy savings, uh, all of these facts, you know, these various factors are, are considered and used, you know, in the judgment of the responsible m and professional, you collect data and make adjustments for these factors that might be driving changes in energy consumption other than the actual efficiency measure, because we want to isolate the effect of that energy efficiency measure, whatever it might be. Next slide, please. So overall, you can think of this. This is a very good um, visual, if you will, of a metaphor for what M&V is. You're balancing accuracy, which is quantified by uncertainty in M&V terms, uh, versus the M&V cost. Uh, if money was no object, every system could be, you know, metered to the nth degree, uh, collect data on all those potential confounding factors like production, outdoor air temperature, uh, occupancy, and so on, and you know, every project, you know, in principle at least, could be very highly accurately um, quantified the savings. But of course, that's not the real world. Uh, costs and resources are limited, and so the real skill uh, of an experienced m and professional is to help work with the stakeholders to figure out, okay, what is the appropriate level of uncertainty that's needed here? And how do we strategically divide, divide um, uh, create, let's say, an MNV plan and an MNV process that achieves that at minimum cost of doing MNV itself? Because MNV costs costs money itself for instruments and people and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, again, these are some common protocols. The IP MVP is listed there. Uh, ASHRAE 14 is a very good one, especially for some of the specific uncertainty calculations. Notice there's a 2023 version. ASHRAE just came out in August. Please, my uh, recommendation, do not use ASHRAE 14 from um, the 2014 version, which is now about 10 years old and even less desirable. There's a 2002 version of ASHRAE 14 you can find on the internet for free. Um, I'd say don't use that, use the most recent edition. Um, ASHRAE publications do cost money, but if you're gonna do the M&B, um, do it. Uh, use the most recent protocols. Uh, there are many protocols, uh, the international standards or ISO has them as well. Next, next slide, please. So this is just showing <clears throat> Um, a summary of the IP MVP core concepts. So it does, it defines terminology, methods, best practices for writing MNV plans, reports, and um, doing basic calculations. Uh, the other thing, and there, there's a slide in this, um, in our webinar here that provides some resources, links to resources. But what I want to point out is EVO or the Efficiency Valuation Organization has many resources beyond just the basic um, core concepts, such as, um, well, I'll talk about those later. Next slide, please. So this is the ASHRAE uh, m and um, uh, best practice, if you will. And again, the 2023 edition, please take note of that because it's recently become available and, and don't avoid using outdated versions. Next, please. Uh, m and certifications are very important, certainly in my opinion, and it, the industry, if you will, is very fortunate to have two uh, very credible and um, certification programs. Uh, so Association of Energy Engineers, and it's delivered through CIT here in Canada, offers the CMVP. I'm a, a CMVP trainer. I've been so for several years. Uh, excellent certification. Um, you know, as I mentioned in the intro, I'm also PMVA certified. So EVO has its own certifications, the PMVA, which is for an analyst. They actually have a PMVE, 
which stands for expert, a more advanced certification. And um, so if, if M&V is worth doing, in my opinion, it's worth uh, retaining, it's worth retaining uh, a certified professional, which means they're going to have some basic training and experience in order to um, earn those certifications. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, there are some good free resources here. So Evo World has a lot of great resources. One in particular I'll mention is that the forthcoming, there is a new version in 2024 of the Uncertainty Assessment Guide. So if you go to Evo World right now and set up, let's say an email and a password, you can get free access to many of their application guides. One would be the 2019 Uncertainty Guide, which is actually pretty good. Uh, but just one note is that there's there's a new uncertainty assessment guide coming out, and they're they're always um, essentially always in a mode of of updating their um, uh, best practices guides. I'll call them another excellent source for M and V and and let's say DSM best practices in general is Bonneville Power Authority. Uh, the U.S. federal government uh, owns the authority, and by their rules, they share everything publicly. And if you go to that link or just Google bpa.gov measurement and verification, you'll quickly find these links and the MNV reference guides. There are a lot of excellent, freely available, carefully written uh, reference guides. Just to mention one is regression modeling for MNV, but that's certainly not the only one. There, there's many great resources there. And again, BPA has a history of updating those materials every, you know few years as appropriate. Next slide, please. Okay, let's get into M&V methods and best practices. Next. So again, we, you can't, in principle, you can't measure energy saving. It's the absence of energy consumption. So savings are determined and that word determined is bold because that's how, um, that's the language, let's say chosen in the IP MVP protocol um, is you, quantify the baseline period energy, your post or reporting period energy. And very importantly, there's almost always the need to do adjustment because the conditions change from baseline to reporting period, like outdoor air temperature change and so on. Uh, next slide, please. There's three basic approaches to doing m &V. The most common is what is called avoided energy. And by default, uh, that's what people are usually talking about with M and V is an avoided energy approach, and we'll do that really for the remainder of this webinar. Um, the avoided energy just means we're we're saying that the reference conditions are what those conditions are during the reporting period, the post install. So, for example, the outdoor air temperature profiles, we'll say those are the reference conditions and the occupancy rates, if that were to be important, and you actually had data on it. And then you would adjust baseline energy to what that energy would have been if the reporting period, outdoor air temperature and occupancies had existed under with the inefficient system. So that's a default and we'll show a chart to kind of reinforce that concept. Um, you should know there are other approaches, backcasting, it's rarely used, but in certain cases it's, it's needed where the baseline period is is those conditions are the reference conditions and what one would do is make adjustments to the reporting period energy um, it, it, just complete opposite of what is typically done and then the third approach is called normalized um, that's where let's say a financing agency doesn't necessarily want to know what the savings are for the one year following a project install but they would like to know what is let's say the long-term average and let's say for an HVAC system upgrade, um, you wouldn't, you know, what if it's just a warm winter? And so you, you, you're not going to want to project those warm winter heating savings to the long term. And so you can use typical meteorological year temperature profiles or TMY. Um, and then you can adjust your baseline data and your reporting period data to these um, to these reference conditions, which are neither the baseline nor the reporting period. So just so you know that there is a, that is a sec, you know, it's a second most common approach, but uh, the avoided energy is the most common. Next, please. So, you know, it's very tempting when projects are done 
to think of M and V as starting after the install. <laughs> and that is possible, it's feasible. Last week on Friday, I went to a site to start a project that was installed and commissioned in September. And we're talking about doing M and V um, uh, and, and getting some results uh, by like the first week of December, right? We're here in the middle of November already. Uh, and that, that's possible depending on the circumstances, but the best practice is that m &V starts with project planning and you write an m &V plan. And it's important to consider, okay, who are the stakeholders and why are, is m &V being done? What is and is not going to be measured? And you know, part of that question is how much is it going to cost? Who's going to do it? Uh, who is the responsible m &V professional? Again, my experience, my advice is, um, yes, you can find professionals who do not have certifications and can do a very good job. Well, that may be true, and I know individuals who fit that very well. In general, get a certified person. Um, I've also working with examples, some very recent, where non-certified professionals are in charge and it creates problems for multiple stakeholders. Uh, those adjustments tend to be really critical. Uh, ESCOs or energy services contracts are, are famous or infamous, if you will, be, for having disputes over adjustments because lo and behold, the conditions under which the baseline were done uh, don't show up or, or change once the um, efficiency projects are installed. And so how do you put numbers around that? How do you make adjustments? Because occupancy changed and the savings are going to go up or down and if they go up the esco gets more money if they go down the owner pays out less money and so it's very important to do the best within reasonable resources to do the best to plan for those adjustments who's going to collect the data what data are going to be collected if it's done as an afterthought it's just rolling the dice taking a chance there's going to be more conflict Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so some of the basics of M and V is think about the measurement boundary, right? What is the system boundary? It's kind of fundamental to science and engineering. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so one of the common choices of measurement boundary is a whole facility, and really that's almost always, but in some cases there's exceptions, but it's almost always the utility meter, right? The, the natural gas company has a gas meter, the electric company has an electric meter. Uh, there's data there that's already available usually, and um, that data can be used for M and V purposes. And we call that a whole facility measurement boundary. Um, next slide, please. Um, there's also retrofit isolation is the other common measurement boundary, and it gets to where um, you really draw a boundary around, let's say, the project itself. So, for example, those ventilation fans I mentioned earlier in this webinar where the savings um, were low for the interim and then they went up. Um, that measurement boundary was around you know the fans the motors and the vfd drives it was not around the whole building so that's another common um, measurement boundary choice next slide please so we'll talk a little bit about the time periods of m and v so you have baseline period you have a installation period and a reporting period so with all these time periods especially the baseline and the reporting period um there are you know, things to look for and choices to be made. So with the baseline period, it gets chosen balancing different factors. So one of the factors is you want to capture all the variations of that process. You want the baseline period to be long enough to capture whatever variations you expect to see. Uh, if it's a heating system, you're going to want to capture the heating season here in North America, right? I don't know, October to March, uh, something like that. Uh, you won't want to measure heating system performance in the summer, or you may not just want to get a January because maybe that doesn't capture enough. Or it's a building that has, uh, let's say, uh, simultaneous heating and cooling throughout the year. Then you're probably going to want a 12-month uh, baseline period. 
The other practical consideration is uh, that comes up is uh, the installation schedule. So it's very common to have, okay, stakeholders such as a project owner, such as a, a utility providing um, a rebate or financing, and the parties get together and say, great, we're going to do M and V. Uh, let's just say it's November. Um, okay, there's an outage scheduled for uh, February 1st, and it's going to be installed then. So that's going to constrain your choice of the baseline period, right? You won't necessarily, uh, something has to be worked out there, right? And that's another practical consideration that comes up. Next slide, please. Uh, so the types of conditions you want to look for, um, you just want to consider the baseline period conditions. And again, that has to do with production rate, occupancy, product quality, whatever, whatever those factors are that are important. And you want to collect that information before the equipment gets ripped out, if it is an equipment um, intensive project or a control setting. Um, control settings are reprogrammed. You want to get that information uh, before and while it's available, because once it's changed, it's usually irreversible. I mean, there are unusual cases where let's say reprogramming can be unprogrammed, shift back to manual. Maybe you're fortunate and you can get by, but you want to collect that because once things are implemented, it usually means your opportunity to collect data are gone. Uh, I'll mention one example. I was at a site visit last week, attempting to do measurement verification for um, a 137 unit multifamily building where they're putting in new windows and they're putting window sensors linked to a smart thermostat where if the windows open for 10 minutes, it triggers the thermostat to shut off the heating system because you don't want occupants leaving the windows open and running the heating system at the same time. Uh, it'd be nice to collect window opening data behavior before the retrofit is done. But in this case, the retrofit's already underway. And so it's too late, right? You can't go back and, and observe what happened because that opportunity is gone. Next slide, please. Okay, the installation period. The key here is that, yes, in a kind of conventional project, there's equipment put in boilers, variable speed drives, heat recovery units, and so on. Um, part of that period is tuning, commissioning, and maybe even training um, O&M procedures, you know, whatever is needed to be done so that that project is, is um, let's say, confirmed and should be operating as intended. So that comprises that that insul installation period before the M and V reporting period starts. So uh, again, it's important to think of all the facets of that, not just the install, but the tuning, commissioning. Do you have commissioning reports to validate it and so on? Next slide, please. Uh, now comes the M and V reporting period. So this is the time period post install where this is another choice of the M and V project is, um, you know, uh, how long is that going to be? Uh, who's going to collect the data and so on? And it's the same kind of factors for the baseline. You want to capture the full operating cycle or variations of the process, depending what that process is. Some industrial plants have processes that don't change much all year round. I can say from experience, you get six weeks of data, maybe that's sufficient. Uh, buildings with heating and cooling, it's very rarely six weeks, no way. You, you you need to get a whole cooling season, a whole heating season, and typically you want 12 months of data. So those are some of the considerations on the choice of the reporting period. Uh, the other thing I'll say about the reporting period is um, the data, the, the consumption data often can indicate when, when it really starts. I've had projects where on paper it said well, this was commissioned in March, I'm thinking of that same actually ventilation project. It's been quite a while, but I'm pretty sure it was declared operational in let's say March of, of a given year, but then the consumption was the same as pre pre install until like August or something like that. And then it, you could see the data drop like a rock and then it stayed down. So, you know, the, the data may tell you when these time periods begin and end. Um, and that's another consideration. You you can have the paperwork say one thing, and the data, meaning the consumption patterns, can tell you another thing. 
And I guess that's just a little anecdote where, you know, an experienced professional uh, can be very useful. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're gonna just overview these four IP MVP options and the same options are used in essentially all protocols. The considerations are how much money is appropriate to spend on m and uh, what data is available, how accurate do the stakeholders need the results, how complex is the project. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so with the IP MVP, and this is just the terminology, it's option A, B, C, or D. I know when I started doing m and probably like 10 years ago, actually, you know, you listen to m and people talk and it's it's like another language, right? Jargon. They're like, oh, I did an option A, I did an option C. And, and people don't explain necessarily, you know, in their context what they mean by that. They assume you know. So this option A, option B, that's literally, as those of you who have experience already know that that's the terminology uh, that's used. So option A and B are retrofit isolation methods. Option A is where you consider all the parameters that are critical and you measure some of them, the key parameters. Option B is more robust, more accurate, more costly, where you isolate the system uh, as far as the measurement boundary. And then you can use the M&V professional judgment. What are all the parameters that are critical? And we're going to measure all of them. So that's by definition uh, what option B is. Next slide. Uh, there's also an option C and option D. Now, um, option C is by definition whole facility. And the most common is let's use the utility electric meter, the utility gas meter. And we're going to draw a system boundary around the whole facility and look at before versus after. And we can do regression modeling of our, let's say, natural gas consumption versus outdoor air temperature or heating degree days. And that's that's a common option C approach. Option D is calibrated simulation. So whenever M and V is being done, we use simulation models such as um, I don't know industrial process. There's models called HISIS, H Y S Y S, or uh, Equest for buildings. You know some sort of uh, kind of physics-based simulation software. And whenever that's used in M and V, it, that's just by definition called option D. So the protocol and this slide imply that option D is really a whole facility approach, and that's not actually entirely correct. I mean, option D can be used for retrofit isolation as well. Um, so that's what option C and D are. Next slide, please. Uh, this um, general uh, chart provides a concept of this avoided energy approach, avoided energy approach to savings, where you have energy versus time on the vertical, obviously time on the horizontal, you've got a baseline period, you've got an implementation period, a reporting period. So the important thing here is that in principle, energy savings, which is illustrated with those black arrows there, is not the difference between just your baseline and your post. It's a difference between your adjusted baseline, what the system would have consumed without the energy efficiency measure and your actual post retrofit system. So that's a very important uh, concept. Now, if it's fortunate and there's really no changes in any important variables before versus after, fine, fair enough. Then your adjustments are zero and just works out that your baseline and your adjusted baseline are the same. That's pretty uncommon for that to be the case, but it's it's you know it does happen. The other thing to think about is MNV is done for new construction. Now new building, new industrial plant, utilities given an incentive for that. What's the baseline there? Well, that's a hypothetical baseline. There is no actual nobody builds uh, a residential home to the minimum code, measures its performance, and then, I don't know, tears it down and then builds the efficient home, and then we'll measure that performance and compare the two, right? Uh, that's nonsense. Um, so in new construction is a very common example where the baseline is purely hypothetical. That adjusted baseline energy is gonna come from a simulation model. So that's a classic option D approach, D as in dog. Next slide. Okay, adjustments are really critical. We've we've hit on this, and this just reinforces the point that 
Um, if operating hours change pre versus post, you want to make or production change for an industrial plant, you need to make adjustments right from the, the baseline to the post. Uh, the way I like to think of it is uh, energy efficiency projects. And again, we could just as well say electrification or distributed generation projects or storage projects or demand response projects. They're, they're real world, they're real world uh, science experiments where you can't control the variables, right? We've all, most of us have had, you know, science courses in school where you get to control your conditions of, of doing an experiment on a lab bench or something. Well, real world projects don't work that way. You, there's no way to control all the variables so that nothing changes except this, you know, we put in this energy efficient system. Now we can just compare before versus after, right? So this is the, this is just fundamentally the concept of adjustments, right? Those conditions, you know, we're, we're working with uncontrolled experiments. People and change things and things happen that the conditions of baseline versus post are very rarely the same. And so we need to make adjustments and put numbers to those adjustments to, to determine the uh, m and savings. Next slide. So adjustments are categorized into routine or non-routine. Um, in simple terms, I, I think routine is best thought of factors that are likely or expected to vary. So if you're doing a building project, you should expect outdoor air temperature to change. For buildings, usually you don't expect hours of operation to change, so those might be considered a non-routine adjustment. Um, in, a, in an industrial plant, uh, our operating hours actually are a routine adjustment. It, they're, they're very rarely exactly the same, and it makes a difference, so you should just plan on adjusting for operating hours. Uh, product mix probably is expected not to change in many cases, but surprises happen and you might find that wow the product mix changed uh, that that becomes a non-routine adjustment um, this is a good time to mention that covid is one big non-routine adjustment event right for buildings um, because of covid occupancy rates plummeted nobody expected that to happen imagine you put in an energy efficient project and commissioned it in you know january 2020 uh, guess what? Occupancy plummeted, uh, whatever, eight weeks later. Um, uh, ventil even post-COVID, then the ventilation rates are, in many cases, never the same as what they were before. So that, that means you have to take that into account through adjustments. Next slide, please. So when it comes to the, let's say, the responsible M&B practitioner doing their report and doing the calculations and methodology, so this just is speaking to the idea that uh, it's important to document the, the methods, the data that collected, um, make that data transparent, um, state all the key assumptions that were made, uh, describe the baseline in the post. And, and again, the IP MVP provides good guidance on what to put in your m &V report and all the, the um, parameters that are important. Next slide, please. So this just gives an example and reporting, there's different metrics that um, I'll call these metrics that may be used. Of course, energy is almost always important, right? Cubic meters of natural gas or kilowatt hours of electricity, uh, maybe liters of propane or something like that. Sometimes water is quantified, sometimes not. Um, valuation of energy savings is important, although in some projects that valuation is not really put in the m and report, um, but it, it, it is a common um, uh, element to include and the IP MVP will provide guidance on that. Sometimes the associated GHG emission reductions are, are required in the reporting. Uh, what's important is that all these metrics that are expected to come out of the m and project are best documented in the m and plan because there's data, there's time and effort and money effective as essentially that goes into, you know, the more metrics you want to report, the more data you need, the more time and effort it takes, and you need to plan ahead uh, and just simply put it in the M&V plan. Next slide, please. Uh, M&V, uh, this is the only slide we have on statistics. Maybe one of the future webinars will do some statistics basics, but yeah, we're working with numbers. And so averages, um, deviations, errors, 
uh, are all become important, especially in putting some numbers around the uncertainty of the findings. And the three common sources of uncertainty as shown here are modeling, sampling, if sampling is used, and measurement uh, errors. Next slide, please. Uh, I already mentioned about valuing energy savings. And the key concept here is that it should be based on the marginal rates. Uh, so think of a standard utility bill, uh, if there is such a thing, but a common utility bill for natural gas or electricity. There's going to be fixed charges on there. And no matter how efficient the project is, uh, those fixed charges are not going to be changed. So you really just want what components of the bill will change if the consumption change or if the peak demand changes. Um, that's the important um, idea of the, the marginal rates or the marginal value of energy savings. So what you should not do is just take the total utility bill cost and the total consumption and divide those numbers and say, oh, you know, it's X dollars per kilowatt hour or X dollars per gigajoule because that overall blended cost is an average. It's not going to be the marginal because you, you've you lumped in there costs, you know, rate riders and fixed charges that may, ne may not change based on what the project was. Um, uh, carbon taxes and other things can be considered as well. Next slide, please. So we'll just step through this. The best practices for M and V. Uh, it's important from the start. The first step is not what's the best me best method. The first step is not. Um, these are things I've heard many times. Uh, what's the best method? Uh, are we going to do option C? Should we use the utility meter? How much are the the meters going to cost? You know, those are not the first questions asked. First question are, who's the stakeholders here? Every system has an owner. Most projects have, well, all fault projects have financers. Sometimes it's an owner, but most often it's a utility or a government loan or some other you know, energy services uh, company. Uh, operation maintenance staff, equipment suppliers, the M&D professional, those are the stakeholders. Um, hit enter again. So then after the stake, those uh, stakeholders are identified, those stakeholders have a say in what are we trying to achieve here? What are the objectives? We need to meet the finance requirements so we get the loan or the rebate or the subsidy. Um, do we want to think ahead with this? We're investing in m &V. Do we want to think ahead to integrate this into the, let's say, the building automation system or the DDC for a commercial building so that these sensors and essentially these tools, like we're going to develop baseline models as a tool, those can be rolled into some longer term energy saving tools like monitoring, targeting, and reporting. Um, operation and maintenance, are we going to, like, uh, geez, in an industrial plant, you know, link um, vibration analysis to energy or something like that. These are things that could be done. Enter, please. Then you write an M&V plan and you think about all the critical items. And M&V plans can be really short, to be honest. But or that's that's my experience and many others. It does not have to be a long document. Uh, a few pages, five pages, uh, eight, ten pages for a complex project would be a lot. Just what is the system? What is the project? Who are the stakeholders? What's the baseline data and baseline period? How is that going to be chosen? Same for the reporting period. Um, these, these, what are the anticipated adjustments, and and who and how are the data going to be collected? Uh, personnel responsibilities. Who's the leading um, M and V professional? Uh, what what quality checks are going to be done? That type of thing. Enter, please. So then you get into data collection again before equipment is demolished to state the obvious, but <laughs> the obvious doesn't always materialize in real world projects. So you want to get energy data, data for adjustments. Uh, hit enter, please. So a project gets implemented. Um, the next update of these slides really should probably have that just to make it obviously clear. But once systems are after the tuning and commissioning is done, then you get the reporting period and you, you do the data collection analysis reporting payment and close out, uh, hit enter again, please. And then you know, consider integrating with ongoing energy management. So there's a lot invested in meters, sensors, you know, training of people, uh, models, and you can integrate it into you know, ISO uh, systems, 
do what's called QSUM analysis, energy management information systems. Uh, that that's uh, part of best practices. Next, please. <coughs> okay, so um, yeah, next we're moving into the menti.com survey and then also some general uh, question and answer. Thanks very much, Eric, for taking us through the webinar today. I'm looking forward to the question and answer period. Uh, just one last slide, sorry, to stay in the know about news and updates on training offered through Save on Energy. There are some links below. And thank you, everybody, for your time. All right, so now we're going to move to our mentee and do the next question. So you should be able to, um, so we're gonna do some questions built around this for a few minutes and then we'll do general Q&A. So you should go to menti.com and you should see the code once, use the code 17783829. So adjustments to baseline energy are done to account for what? Check all that apply. Or really, sorry, this is not, this is one correct answer. Okay, we got our first answer. Very good. Okay, we have enough responses so far. Yeah, actually, those folks, you got it correct. It is all the above. Routine, non-routine, um, those are all subject to adjustments. Okay, here's a, one of my favorite questions. So the billing rate determines your valuation of your savings. <clears throat> so let's say you have an inclining block natural gas rate it's a fixed cost and it's four dollars per gigajoule for the first 100 gigajoules per month once that facility goes over 100 gigajoules it's six dollars per gigajoule so what is the marginal value of natural gas savings what's your best answer So I like to see different responses because it generates some debate and maybe change some thinking. Okay, well, we have enough answers. We're gonna say the correct answer is not enough information. So first of all, you definitely would not really wanna use the blended cost because that blended cost includes fixed costs, which do not change. <clears throat> So that $100 per month is going to be there no matter how much natural gas you save. You could run it to zero. You're still going to pay the fixed cost. And we don't know where the consumption sits and how much the savings are. If the consumption is 200 gigajoules per month and you're saving 50, then it's going to save $6 per gigajoule. If your baseline consumption is 80 gigajoules per month, your savings are all going to be valued at $4. So not enough information. Um, okay, we'll do this one quickly. A comprehensive building retrofit where it's not essential to validate performance of individual measures. What's the best method? So option A or B, retrofit isolation, C, whole facility, or D, use computer simulation. <clears throat> Yeah, so the 17 of you got it correct. Yeah, for this, you could use whole facility. And again, if you need, if, if you're getting funding from ISO, just hypothetically, and they say, well, you need to report m and savings for each individual measure, then option C is out because you're not going to be able to um, disaggregate and separate the savings of individual measures. 
Um, okay, a simple calculation. You can do it in your head. So let's say a convention hall has HVAC upgrades. The baseline electricity is 2300 megawatt hour per year. The cooling degree day adjusted baseline is 2400 megawatt hours per year from your baseline model. And then you measure 1700 megawatt hour per year in the reporting period. So what is your savings reported from M and V? Yeah, we have enough response. It's definitely the 700. So again, it's not just what was measured in the baseline, but it's the adjusted baseline, right? So it is 700, it's not 600, and you do have enough information. Um, I'm going to skip that one and get, um, okay, this is a real project. I'm going to seek some answers here. So I was actually at a site visit last week. So the measure, um, no, this is a different one, sorry, <laughs> but it is a real project. <clears throat> so I was involved in a project. I did the M and B analysis using option C, whole facility utility meter, and it came out with negative savings. So it was not positive savings, but negative. So the energy increased after adjusting for outdoor air temperature and other variables. Um, so what the explanation is, well, in, it turned out, unbeknownst to me, because I, uh, I didn't get to go to the site, and anyway, this happens, but it was discovered that some warehouse space in the baseline had been converted to office space. So the question now, and this is a very real, this is a municipality in Canada that this is being done for, how, how can you do, can you do M and V? And if so, what would you do? So option C was already done. So I'm gonna say, well, doing option C again, probably is not gonna work. So is it feasible to do M and V? Can you do go back and do retrofit isolation? So yeah, the folks who have answered it is option D is correct, which by the way, people need to be careful with polls. This happens where I, I did a class once that had a, a simple pump calculation, had 30 people and 29 people gave one answer and one person gave the correct answer. And what happened is uh, a lot of people were socially influenced by seeing a different answer. But yeah, so this is a choice where, yeah, you can go back and simulate that baseline energy for that warehouse space and how it would have, how much consumption would have occurred had it been converted to office space with office space use with the less efficient baseline equipment. So that would involve, um, you could do a building energy simulation and do the m and Now the reality is it's more costly and, and the, the client in this case is actually not gonna do the m and because just of the cost of doing option D hiring a consultant, doing the simulation, and so on. Um, Eric, uh, I just want to jump in. We've got about five minutes remaining. Yeah, I'd say let's just go to questions now. And let's let's, um, let's uh, stop doing the poll and take the time we have for questions. Okay. We haven't gotten a lot of questions in the chat. Um, there's been some contributions um, to your presentation. One question that we have here is, what is the re recommended post-project M&V period according to EVO, or is there one? Yeah, I can see that, Jesse. Um, yeah, again, a very good question. Um, the, the protocols do not... Uh, are not prescriptive about those types of details. So the um, reporting period in the EVO, in the IP MVP, it's not, it doesn't prescribe. All it says is really the MNV professional, and it should be documented in the MNV plan, you wanna choose that reporting period long enough to capture the process variations of interest. And you know, and that, there's always practical considerations too, which is, this is very common. I'm doing m and for a project uh, right now, <laughs> and um, 
the utility wants to be able to pay, and the customer both are want to have the incentive paid out before the end of this calendar year. So they want that M&B done ASAP. Me, just being the technical person, I would love to have 12, 12 months reporting period, but it's going to be cut short. So there's, there's no um, prescription for that. Um, yeah, and I'm just looking at, at the comment from Joseph about whole facility savings and 10%. That's that's the um, so what that is is I'll just speak to that for uh, option C using utility bill or whole facility the conventional guideline was that you would want your savings to be you know a big enough signal on your utility bill about ten percent and that is true in the past but with um, actually uh, IP MVP has revised that it, it can be much lower it could be. 5% or even less because of uh, interval data and more accurate modeling. So I've actually done um, option C modeling with monthly data where I've been able to report uncertainty, meeting all the requirements of even like two or 3% savings, meaning the savings are about two or 3% of the baseline utility bill. So that 10% is a little outdated, but it is still commonly cited. Um, I could do one more Menti question if people want two minutes. I see uh, one more question here. What types of projects would allow for IPMVP option A? Um, is yeah. this typically the least costly method? Um, yeah, it's well, option, it depends. Option C is hard to beat for cost a lot of times. Mm -hmm. uh, the common, uh, that's a great question. Option A, if we had time for case studies or these future webinars, we'll probably do it. Uh, the most common option A is lighting, where an option B approach is you measure the power and you measure the operating hours. But very often for lighting, uh, one of either the power consumption or the operating hours are, let's say, stipulated or known from past data, and you only measure one thing. So for example, an option A for lighting would be, well, we're gonna use time of use loggers on the lighting, and we're gonna use power consumption from baseline measurement or you know, from some stipulated measurements that were not actually done on the system as installed. So that would technically be an option A. Thank you. Uh, we're just at the one minute mark before our session ends. I'm going to invite anybody to ask a last question. I also did put a survey link in the chat that helps us to plan future surveys and adapt the way that we're presenting things. So if everybody could take two to three minutes on your way out to respond to that, we would appreciate it greatly. Yeah, yeah court cases. Fortunately, I haven't got into court with m and but I, I do have one project <laughs> where it might go to the BC Utilities Commission, a dispute oh. over the m &V findings, but probably won't. But disputes happen. It's unavoidable. It's people. <laughs> yes, especially when there's money involved. People and money. That's <laughs> a formula for dispute. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you all for joining us today and thanks Eric for the great presentation and the engagement through Mentimeter. I enjoyed that. Uh, I will hang out here in case anyone has any last questions. Otherwise, stay tuned on the Save on Energy's website uh, training and information. Uh, we will be having more webinars, including in this MNV series. Oh, one last question from Jean-Francois. What do you do with COVID? So that would sure. fall under the adjustments. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, um, I know people need to log off, feel free. But yeah, COVID is your classic non-routine adjustment, right? So, and that that factors into a lot of things such as choice of baseline period. Um, it, Evo at the evoworld.org website, you will find uh, there is a guide on non-routine adjustments that really was written uh, all about COVID or mostly about COVID, meaning because of COVID, obviously occupancy schedules changed. Uh, obviously, 
ventilation rates changed and that has a lot of influence on how m and is done so i do a lot of m and for a municipality and we're very often choosing our baseline period to be guess what calendar 2019 and why would we do that because of covid so the best practices i know in our slides it says well choose the baseline period to be the most recent period before the retrofit was done well what if that happens to overlap with covid and you know the ramp up or the changes right so yeah covid is is a big non-routine adjustment um and again check evoworld.org there's a whole report guide on non-routine adjustments look for that buzzword and you'll find a report published just in 2021 post covid obviously 2021 i think good question Uh, utility incentive window is too short to capture proper M and V. Jesse, if that's regarding the save and energy programs, typically the the deadlines that Vicky shared earlier today would be for um, submitting an application. So most of the save and energy programs require you submit an application and go through a pre-approval process first. Then you do your project, and then you would do your M and V. So that deadline shouldn't impact your ability to complete a project in time. But it's a good you know, if for those who can stay on, I and it looks like 41 people are on, I'll, I'll just comment. <laughs> Even one of my questions, we didn't have time, but I was just Friday at a site, a new thermal heater in an industrial plant. This is the one where the utility and the customer both want the incentive paid out by the end of the year. So they want M and V results. Um, <laughs> this one is really a challenge because, uh, I mean, Friday is the first time I saw the system. So obviously the M and V started there was no m and plan there was no let's say you know deliberate baseline data collection and guess what they they want results in a few weeks um well so what am i going to do well okay i can tell you that okay just because the m and did not start pre-install there are baseline data available and so fortunately we may be doing just fine with the baseline data which is the efficiency and performance of the old heaters that were ripped out. There's no, it's a data, it's a pie historian in an industrial plant, not a building automation system because it's an industrial plant. But yeah, building automation system in a building can have baseline data, but you have to question how accurate is it? <laughs> uh, that That's one of those important details, just because you have numbers um, and, and from, you know, data, how, how, how accurate are they? But, you know, back to the question from Jesse about the incentive window is too short. Well, in my opinion, I've told the utility and the customer that in my opinion, it, pro it probably is too short, but I, I can report interim m and by the first week of December. I would hesitate to say it captures a whole, it, it can't capture a whole year because the driving factor in this project is actually the production schedule. So the customer says, we don't actually know our production, what we our, our manufacturing production changes based on customer demand. And we can put a forecast together, but we have no idea what it's going to go up and down throughout the year. So it doesn't change with outdoor air temperature, but the savings is definitely proportional to how many batches of this batch process. And they just openly say they look, you know, they've been there for decades. They know that they can't predict within exactly what they're, you know, accurate enough. So I can't forecast 12 month savings when I know that the production batch schedule is going to change a lot. But what I can do within the incentive window time is give an interim result for the time we do have. And just reported at that so you know you can't do the impossible and that's sounds like a statement of the obvious but it's like nobody can give an accurate projection of 12 month savings when you don't even know the production schedule for the next you know they said that we couldn't even tell you for sure next week because it just changes the orders come in we do a bunch of batches orders go down you know we'll be idling for a day here or there that's just how it goes yeah good question Okay, well, maybe we'll wrap it up. I do have a 
15, my local time in Vancouver here, but uh, meeting to go. Thank you everybody for joining us today. I hope you have a great Tuesday and good rest of your week. All right, take care everybody. Thank you.